number 10. Kasei and Yamada from Kasei-san and Morning Glories. Fuck it, I don't care. Kasei and Yamada are so high up on this list only because they are so goddamn cute together. One's an energetic and popular track star, and the other is a reserved and quiet girl of the Garden Club. Again, I love opposite to track kind of couples. Much like with Kasukabe and Sajo, I love how they go through real life relationship troubles. Kase is worried that she might be going too fast intimately for Yamada and she might reject her for it. And Yamada thinks that Kase is too good for her. Kase has bigger breasts than her and Yamada doesn't consider herself cute at all. Plus, again, like in most Yuri anime and manga, the fear of separation after graduating from high school. Thankfully, they are able to move past these struggles by using, say it with me, communication. Yeah, it's much easier in a relationship when both parties communicate with each other. It's such a wonderful thing. By using communication, Kase and Yamada are able to talk to each other about their problems, whether in the relationship or something else happening. Through communication, Kase is able to learn to go slow when being intimate with Yamada, and Yamada isn't so easy to doubt herself when it comes to dating Kase. Everything is nice and consensual, and that's always a beautiful thing to have in a relationship. In the end, Kase and Yamada are just two adorable idiots. It's perfect Yuri fluff, with just a minor amount of complexity that make them too engaging and fun gay girls to watch. So, what about morning glories? They mean fleeting love. That's right. <laughs> but there's another meaning, right? <laughs> Number 9. Isabella from Paradise Kiss. Isabella is a very regal lady, always wearing elegant Victorian-like dresses and extravagant hats. She's a fabulous woman who is sort of the mother figure of Para Kiss. She helps Yukari with her school troubles and comforts Miwako when she's having relationship problems with Arashi. I also like her friendship with George, perhaps the only person who truly accepted her when they were kids. Speaking of, I love the flashback scene of Isabella and George. George giving Isabella a dress he made just for her. It was meant to celebrate her real birthday instead of Daisuke the boy's birthday. Learning that George made the outfit himself, Isabella is inspired to make outfits with him. Since that time too, with George telling her how cute she is, is when she started becoming her true self, saying that it was thanks to George's clothes that she was able to become her true self. Isabella tells Yukari that she can't help that she wasn't born a girl, but by dressing like a girl, she's able to give birth to something inside her something magical. I also like how Isabella doesn't take anyone's transphobia. Rather, it's her teacher still calling her male, her parents upset at the way the butler raised Isabella, or the trouble she might get helping Yukari get ready for the fashion show in the women's dressing room. Isabella now knows who she is, and the clothes that she wears gives her the courage to face these people with a smile on her face. Ever since then, I've been celebrating my new birthday. I can't help that I wasn't born a girl. But by dressing like a girl, I'm able to give birth to something else inside me. Something magical. Dressing beautifully fills people with courage and gives them confidence. That is what I believe in my heart. And this is why I make clothes with George. You can feel the magic he's cast over you too, can't you? Number 8. Jerry from Revolutionary Girl Utena. Or in my previously mentioned top 10 gay women in anime video, I put Utena and Anthe in the list. And while I still love these two, both individually and as a couple, upon a second viewing I had recently of the anime, Jerry stuck out more to me and has become my new favorite. Now, of course, our first centric episode where we learned that the picture in her locket is of a girl named Shiori instead of a boy that Shiori was dating is hella predictable. You can see it coming a mile away. Back then though, these types of stories weren't seen that much. And besides, even though it's still predictable, <laughs> the reveal is still great, thanks to excellent writing, visual storytelling, and voice acting. Her other three centric episodes expand her complex relationship with Shorty and how Shorty is actually really toxic towards Jory. But Jory's love towards her is too powerful to let go of. Thankfully, by the end, she is able to let go, and things sort of switch around. Now it's Shorty who is pining for Jory from afar, getting jealous when Jory flirts with Utena. Jordi concludes herself that though she may still have lingering feelings for Shiori, it's not good to follow after a girl who is just going to use you for her own means. That's still such a powerful character arc throughout the three seasons of Revolutionary Girl Utena. I also like how supportive Jordi is towards Utena, even when they have to duel each other every so often. 
She helps Utena discover her bisexuality and feelings for Amphi, and she helps her take back her identity from Toga. Jordi is just one of those characters that gets better and better every single time I rewatch the anime, and I'm sure she'll just get better in my future viewings of Revolutionary Girl Utena. あなたは奇跡の力にどんな思いを託していたのでしょうか。そしてその思いは誰かに当てたものだったのでしょうか。願わくばその思いが届きますように。Number seven, Yuri and Victor from Yuri and Ice. Here they are, the duo that was born to make history. The ones that made all the fangirls go over the top eight shit. But I still love these two ice skating idiots. There's no denying that after Yuri on Ice aired in the fall 2016 season of anime, Yuri and Victor quickly became the most popular queer couple in anime. Yuri is the shy, introverted gay, and Victor is the flamboyant and confident gay that will break Yuri out of his shell, whether he's ready for it or not. I also like how Yuri is not only in love with Victor, but also inspires to be like him. Victor is his item, and he wants to be like him, and Victor will help him do just that, by breaking out the Edos that is lying deep inside Yuri, just ready to break out. Something that I've recently realized is that there's a little age gap between the two. Yuri is 23 and Victor is 28. Now this type of age difference is seen in a bunch of BL slash Yaoi anime and manga, but in those, there's a creepy power dynamic that the older one has over the younger one. But in Yuri on Ice, there isn't any weird dynamic like that. Each has equal levels of being the more dominant one and being the more submissive one. Speaking of, their sexual love is just too over the top. Having multiple public showings of affection, whether it was the hug and kiss in front of the world, or the proposal that the two shared. And you know what? It's also nice to see adult gay men. It's a rarity in anime most of the time, so I gotta praise it when I see it done well. The flirting, the kiss, the proposal, the final dance, it's all just too much to handle. It's all that makes Yuri and Victor a couple that was born to make history. Now if you'll excuse me, I'm gonna start creating the Yuri spin-off anime, Yaoi on Fire. <laughs> Seduce me with everything you have. If your performance can enthrall me, then you can bring the whole audience to their knees. That's what I say in practice, right? Number 6. Hana from Tokyo Godfathers. Now this is a portrayal of trans women that is not seen in many other places. Her voice is deep, her appearance looks masculine, and Hana doesn't inhabit the qualities that one would instantly identify with a trans woman. But that doesn't matter to Hana. She knows she's a woman, and that's all there is to it. Hana doesn't take anyone's shit. Whether it's others calling her names or referring to her as a he, people who call her old and ugly, she doesn't give a shit. She's proud of who she is and she'll show it to everyone. Hana is also very protective of the ones she cares about. While she and Toru argue and bicker a lot, she's ready to become the bad guy in order for Toru to look better in front of his daughter. She's sweet and kind to Gein, but puts her in her place when she's acting rude. And she's ecstatic at the idea of being a mother to the baby the three found in the trash. It's all she's wanted to be and now is the opportunity to become one. And again, the beatdown of Toru is just excellent. I can watch that scene forever. In the end, Hana is just a lot of fun and the type of transgender character that you don't often see portrayed. And she's one of the reasons that I love this insane Satoshi Kon comedy. So, Kenja nakunatta no. He's a... Number 5. Yumir and Historia from Attack on Titan. My god, do I love these two women and the tragedy of their relationship. Their tragic upbringing, their tragic relationship, and their tragic future. They both have secret pasts that they don't tell the other characters for a while. Ymir's secret is being someone from outside the walls as well as being a titan shifter. Historia's secret is being the illegitimate heir to the throne. The only people that they tell at first are each other. Ymir turns into a titan to save Historia and the others, and Historia tells Ymir her real name instead of Krista, just like the two promised to each other years ago. And their tragic childhoods is what draws the two of them to each other. Ymir approached Historia at the Survey Corps when she heard the priest of the church talking about her upbringing and realized that she and Historia share so much in common. Throughout the anime, especially the second season, the only thing that is on each girl's mind is each other making sure each one is happy, being there for each other, and loving each other. I love Ymir's frequent asks of marrying Historia that seem comical at first, but you later start to realize how genuine they are. 
which makes it all tragic when Ymir decides to leave Historia to save Reiner and Berthold, to pay them back for eating their friend when she was a regular titan. During the third season, Historia uses the confidence and love that Ymir gave her in order to stand up to her father and become the new queen of the kingdom within the wall. And last we see of the two's love is a letter that Ymir sent to Historia before her death, saying that her biggest regret is not truly marrying Historia. And from Astoria's words, there's no denying that she would have accepted Ymir's proposal. Ymir and Astoria are two tragic characters that can't be together because of the world they live in and the circumstances that also happen to bring them together. Thankfully, we have Attack on Titan Junior High to see the two girls alive and happy together. And you know what? Maybe that's enough for me. Historia. Number four, Ryu and Mabu from Zeta San Mai. Another recent queer couple from last year, and it's one that I almost instantly fell in love with. Ryu and Mabu are two police officers that also work for the Outer Empire to extract the desire of criminals and turn them into Kappa zombies. They also plan to steal the five silver plates from our Kappa boys, though Ryu is doing it for his own means. Obviously, my favorite thing about these two is the dance sequence that they have in almost every episode. They are two utterly sexy men who dance fabulously. Rhea reaching into Mabu pulling out his heart in a very similar way that Utena reaches into Anthi to pull out her sword for dueling. Both Kunihiku Ikohara and both super gay. But I wouldn't enjoy them so much if it wasn't for their tragic and sacrificial nature. Having been injured by the Otter and Kappa War, Mabu was at death's door until the Otter Empire brought him back to life. Except this time, with a mechanical heart, a different Mabu than he used to be. The Otters used this to control Ryo to work for them and get the five silver plates. Ryo portrays them and Mabu admits that he still loves Ryo no matter what. Ryo realizing that this person that he called a doll is still the same Mabu. This unfortunately causes Mabu to die, Ryo being shot by Toi shortly after. Both have to hurt each other, to save each other. They bring each other pain through their actions, because they truly do love each other. Thankfully, they come back after Prince Kepe fuses back with his dark self in order to help the Kepe boys defeat the otters in the concept that defined them. They crown their daughter as princess, set her off to be married to Kepe, and now work together as rickshaw drivers. Speaking of, I love their interactions with baby Sada in the prequel manga. These two dads and a magical baby are just too precious and cute. Ryu and Mabu are my favorite part of Zada San Mai, and they are characters that I'll continue to watch dancing for a long time. Let desire flow, every last drop. Yo! Number 3. Yuki from Wandering Sun. Probably my favorite transgender character in all of anime, Yuki is a character that I probably relate the most to out of all the other characters that I relate to on this list. Yuki's backstory with her boyfriend Shina is just great. They both went to the same middle school, but Yuki stopped going there after being forced to wear the female uniform in front of everyone, causing her to fall into a deep depression and stopped attending school entirely. Shina, in the meanwhile, liked it as a kid when his sisters dressed him up as a girl, but as he got older and he stopped being cute, he didn't dress up with his sisters anymore. He stopped wanting to be a girl. The two meet up again when they heard about each other when they were older and they started to go out. Their relationship is so adorable. Yuki can be overly energetic for Shina sometimes, but he loves her regardless. Plus, I think that this is the only time in anime where I've seen an adult transgender character be in a relationship with someone. It's kind of nice. Now the two of them, especially Yuki, can help our two main transgender protagonists, Nituri and Tatsuki, with their struggling gender identity. She gives them guidance when they need help with them growing up too fast or dealing with a bully. I especially like how when Nituri's bully, Dayo, makes Nituri introduce him to Yuki when he falls in love with her, but is horrified to find out that Yuki is transgender. Yuki then basically wakes up Shina, who is sleeping and tells Dayo, I'm a woman who was born a man and is now dating a man, you got a problem with that? She sees a lot of her past self in Nitori and so helps her out whenever she can. I also love queer shows that feature cult queer characters for two reasons. One is that these older characters can give guidance to our main characters. The other is that it shows these queer kids that you can have a happy and fulfilling life, sometimes alongside someone while also being queer. 
showing an audience that might not know that it is normal too. Yuki is such a great character, her relationship with Shina is sweet and heartwarming, and she's a great mother figure that both need to dig into Tatsuki. What's not to like? Number 2 Toya and Yukito from Cardcaptor Sakura This time I'm going with my own personal feelings instead of the popular opinion unlike the previous gay men and anime list that I had, so I'm ranking Toya and Yukito higher on this list than Yuri and Victor. And it's honestly because Toya and Yukito are my two favorite gay male characters in anime. Because their relationship is so goddamn cute! In movies and TV shows that feature relationship, I'm actually a big fan of slow burn relationships, where the two characters take forever to get together, mostly because they are two awkward idiots or they keep on getting interrupted at the worst possible time right before confessing. I love all of these frustrating and agonizing moments, and Toya and Yukito are no exception. We always see them together and see them genuinely care about the other. It's also pretty funny that whenever Sakura tries to take Yukito somewhere on a date, her brother Toya always happens to be at the place working part time to interrupt any romantic moment that Sakura was trying to set up. But it's super cool when towards the end of the series, when Sakura confesses her feelings towards Yukito and he turns her down, she instantly knows that it must be because Yukito likes her big brother. And she's supportive of them. My favorite moment between Toya and Yukito is during the third season when Yukito continues to fall unconscious due to his other self, Yue, losing power due to Sakura's lack of magical power. Toya constantly worries about him and tries to tell him that he knows about Yui and that he wants to help because he loves him. But these moments are always interrupted by Naruku. But in the end, Toya ends up sacrificing his magical powers, the ability to see the spirit of his deceased mother, and sense whenever Sakura is in danger, to give Yui enough strength to stay alive and save Yukito. This being officially when they start to go out. Funny because there's a recurring gag where many of the high school girls are confused why Toya and Yukito don't have any girlfriends and always turn down confessions, making them one of the school's many mysteries. Toya and Yukito also happen to be Clam's soul pair. In that, in all of Clam's multiverse properties, they are always shown together and are in love, like in Tsubasa. And that's really awesome. Cardcaptor Sakura has a bunch of queer characters in it, and Toya and Yukito are not only my favorite characters in the show, but also my favorite gay male characters in all of anime. Yuki, I don't think I'm going to be able to Number one, Harakan Michiru, aka Sailor Uranus and Sailor Neptune from Sailor Moon. I tried, guys. I really did. I tried to see if other queer characters or couple changed over time to make me love them more than Harakan Michiru. I tried to see if new queer characters or couples that I discovered after making the list topped Harakan Michiru. But nope. Haruka and Michiru are still my favorite queer characters in all of anime, and I don't think that's ever going to change. Quite honestly, it's all because they are the queer characters that inspire me the most, especially Haruka. Their love is incredible, and no stupid Clover Way dub can take that away by making them cousins. Bitch get out of here, Viz Media actually knows what they're doing. Especially in the fifth season, the sexual innuendos always thrown at each other are always both inappropriate, but at the same time, also kind of amazing. And that's because they don't hide their love for anyone. They'll be flirtatious around anyone and always call each other their partner and special someone. Like when Minako asks Haruka if she has a girlfriend, Haruka bluntly reminds her that they've already talked about this. They'll go to the pool together, the aquarium together, and enter a couple's competition together. And absolutely would have won if they didn't decide to let Umino win for Naru's sake. I also love this moment from an OVA when the fourth season was airing, where the villain is confused why Neptune almost sacrificed the world to save Uranus. She simply says, a world without Haruka isn't worth saving. Yeah, Haruka and Michiru also kind of have a dark side to them. Not only do they flirt with other people to push each other's buttons, but they will also turn to evil, pretend or not, without letting the other guardians know. But no matter what happens to them, if they go to hell for their cruel actions, they'll be damned forever. This culminates in my favorite scene in the entire Sailor Moon anime. Haruka is reflecting on her past actions and what she and Michiru will have to do to retrieve the talisman. 
She thinks of herself as an awful person and doesn't believe that anyone can love these bloody hands that have done harm. Michiru simply locks her hands with Haruka's and says that no matter what happens, she'll always love her hands. Again, if they're going to be damned for their actions, then they'll go to hell together. I also like Haruka and Michiru's little family that they have with Setsuna and Hotoru. It's freaking adorable. Hotaru calling Michiru Michiru Mama and Haruka Haruka Papa. In the end, what else can I say about Haruka and Michiru that I haven't mentioned multiple times throughout my years of doing these videos? I love their love, their sexual innuendos, their caring nature towards each other, their family unit with Setsuna and Utaru, the bad things that they do to either save the world or just each other, and I didn't even talk about the Haruka flashback episode, where we learn how the two first met and fell in love, Haruka deciding to no longer run away from destiny and embrace her future as a Sailor Guardian, all to protect and be with Michiru. These two magical girls have and will always be my favorite queer characters in all of anime. They always remind me to be proud of my queerness every time Pride Month rolls around every year. And I hope that they, as well as any of the other characters on this list, do the same for you. My hands got dirty long ago. There's no turning back now. I'll do whatever needs to be done to get that talisman. <laughs> Michiru? Hey, what is it? Haruka, it'll be alright. No matter what, I'll always love your hands. <laughs>